you know, art is a field, uh, animation is a field with uh, structure, discipline, principles, um, checklists, almost like a science. You need to adjust the way you're promoting and marketing yourself to the HR, not necessarily to the hiring creative directors or heads of these studios. The Tiger Woods, Mozart, these people were not born with some divine spark. They worked hard. We don't see the drafts and the missed shots that they take. We only focus on the highlight reel. But that's really it. Anybody who works hard and sacrifices doesn't quit can do it. Give me your top three things that you could recommend to people who want to get into this industry. I do think you do need to be led by creativity, but it also needs to be married with discipline and logic. The more content that there is out there about you, the more well, hopefully impressed the recruiting agents will be. Um, but there is sort of a temptation to think of it as, a, as a big studio or any studio is like a promised land. If I get there, I just cruise, you know, I made it past the gate. But once you get there, the game really, that's when it begins. Welcome to Mad Artist Publishing, the place to be for short films, VFX, animated shorts, and interviews with directors and animators that create them. I'm your host, Marcin, and today we're chatting with a former Disney and Blue Sky Studios artist, animator, and now an award-winning filmmaker, Mr. Gene Kim. Gene Kim is a Korean-American writer, animator, storyboard artist, and filmmaker. He previously interned at Pixar Animation and worked at Disney Blue Sky Studios on the Epic Rio 2, the Peanuts movie, and Ice Age 5 movies as a production artist. One Last Monster is Gene's latest independent created short, which was written, directed, and produced by himself. He also split the animation work on this film with his good friend Elmer Barsanis over the course of one and a half years, each producing a mind-blowing 10 minutes of animation to the script that he wrote. His previous film was the 2012 Student Academy Award semi-finalist short, Fighting Spirits, about two cyborg ballerinas. <laughs> One Last Monster can be seen on our channel, Mad Artist Publishing, so if you haven't already seen it, I highly, highly recommend that you do. It is 20 minutes, but it's a solid story, and it's super stylized animation, so it's gonna fly by like that. I told you this was bad, Empress. Ready! Do not fear. I do not wish to attack you. What? I have sensed from across the stars that there is a dangerous fire on this world. Only I can destroy it before it destroys us all. Silence! So welcome, Gene, and congratulations on the film. Thank you so much, Marcel. I mean, this is such a honor, such a pleasure to talk to you and just with your audience. Um, yeah, thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for having us. Now, before we dive into the actual film itself, we always want to talk about the filmmaker and the animator. Uh, so can you tell us about yourself? Were you always an artist growing up? Yeah, I was. I, I've loved anime since I was in fourth grade. We had a Toonami in the United States, so Robotech, Gundam Wing, all that, Dragon Ball. I grew up on that stuff, it's in my DNA. Um, but I did start out, um, you know, when I was age 11 with the digital video and live action film. Um, there were classes at the time of my school that were teaching that. So I didn't, be, I didn't really decide to focus on animation until very, you know, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Were your parents supportive of your uh, animation? They were, I think um, at that time they, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really obsessed with anything. I wasn't really committed to anything. And so when they saw me completely taken with filmmaking, um, they were like, okay, this seems like it's it. Let's, let's let the kid do what he wants. Were you study animation or were you self-taught? Well, I went to the uh, grade school, high school, it was a Dalton school in New York, um, private school. Uh, and then at the time there weren't many an uh, animation education resources. So I picked things online. Um, the Maya user manual I held on to for dear life. Um, and I think there were some books like, 3D animation for dummies. So I just basically, as a nerd child, I had right. to make do with what I got. What's your favorite thing about your job as an animator? It's a great question. You know, I think making things that are challenging, like trying to do something um, that you know will be visually interesting or you know complicated, but you know that if you can do it, if you can just like grit it out and make it happen, um, 
that it'll, you know, it might impress people. I think actually accomplishing difficult things is the best part of the job, but also the most painful by definition. Committing yourself to a specific particular project, you know, it's a mindset. So how do you choose the projects that you, that you begin? How do you know that that something is going to turn into something magnificent? You know, it's got to have style and substance. You know, I'm, I'm actually, I realize I'm actually more of a writer that happens to have animation as a hobby. It took me maybe my whole life to realize that. But, you know, if you look at Pixar movies or Studio Ghibli movies, they, they talk about, you know, philosophical issues, uh, social political issues, spiritual issues, uh, in a very entertaining way, in, in ways that are visually spectacular. Um, I've never seen, you know, for example, Spirited Away, talking about childhood growth and maturity. Um, but then you also have this crazy spa castle and these giant, you know, Japanese folklore monsters. It's like, whoa, I'm in another world completely, but you're also telling me something about life, you know? So that's what I, I try to get at, you know, as much as possible, try to show people something they've never seen before, but also a little bit of what you've learned. Uh, what artists or animators do you admire most? Uh, you know, I think I got to go back to Miyazaki and I think Pixar, because even though both of them, um, you know, it's Asian and American, very different, but they're both getting at that style and substance marriage that I was talking about. I also love a lot of non-animation people, you know, filmmakers like Kurosawa or, you know, I'm Korean, so I have to shout out Bong Joon-ho, who won for Parasite recently. Oh, you know, I saw that movie before it actually even oh, really? became streamlined. I remember it was a suggested movie for me on one of my apps, and I was like, oh, what's this? Mm. You know, and I remember watching, and I was like, wow, this is good. Probably a year ago. Yeah, you beat them all to the punch. Yeah, no, very good movie. Oh, the original Old Boy. Have you seen the original oh, Old yeah. Boy? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's like... So good. You don't see that every day, let me tell you. Yeah. I think it's important for animation people to look at non-animation sources of inspiration. Because if all your, if every animator is watching animation things, everything's going to end up looking the same. Most definitely, especially with the, uh, the latest uh, um, Spider-Verse. Right, that's a right. great example yeah. of how animation sort of came out of its own little bubble and managed to yeah. hit a completely different demographic. Mm. I want to see what they were, what was on their summer reading list over at Sony Pictures when <laughs> they were making that. How many more spider people are there? Hey, fellas. Hello. This could literally not get any weirder. It can get weirder. Okay. What's one misconception that people have about artists, animators, and the industry itself? Well, I think this um, extends not just to the animation and film, TV field, but just artists in general. You know, there's that classic cliche, the non-artists look at us and they say, oh, you know, they're just so wishy-washy and undisciplined and they follow their feelings. There's no hard work. It's very like, um, they're very unorganized. And that cliche, I think, is so far from the truth because, you know, art is a field, uh, animation is a field with uh, structure, discipline, principles, um, checklists, almost like a science. You know, it, it, you take something like a walk cycle, for example, that can differ from character to character. You're thinking about physics, you know? You look at how a story is made. Okay, if we put this one scene here, but then put this scene here, it creates this reaction. It's almost like chemistry, you know? And so you really have to like be prepared to, you know, do some homework when you make art, if you want to really um, make something effective. I do think you do need to be led by creativity, but it also needs to be married with discipline and logic to re really, um, you know, have some body and strength to it. So, yeah, if you guys think, if anybody out there thinks that we're not working hard, we are working hard. And a lot of overtime hours as well. Oh, yeah, that too. Well, what are a few things that everybody should know before choosing a career in the art and animation industry? I know you've alluded to some of the things now, but what else should people expect? Um, but there is sort of a temptation to think of as, it, as a big studio or any studio is like a promised land. If I get there, I can just cruise, you know? I'm, I made it past the gate. But once you get there, the game really, that's when it begins. So be open to like hustling double, to working hard and learning, because you never master it. I, you know, I'm not, there's so many artists out there that are way better than me that kick my ass. And so I get pleasure, not from being content, but by learning, honestly. Be open to constructive criticism. And, you know, also there's a lot of other artists I meet that are like, yeah, what if I, you know, spend two, three years at a studio and then create my own content using the connections I make from the studio. It's a good strategy. I just think um, don't push it off while you're working. Always be working on your own original content because you're going to find that maybe you don't like every project or you all of your heart and soul goes into the company's project that you forget about your own creative world. You know, so maintain that as well. Um, 
if possible. But you know, you'll learn so much about like professionalism, teamwork, um, leveling, leveling up your standards. I, I don't think it hurts at all. Would you say these days you need to go to a traditional school to learn the craft of animation or art? I, I think it helps. I mean, just because now HR at any studio is getting thousands of applications and, um, you know, having the accreditation not only helps you stand out, but, you know, in a school environment, whether it's online, like somewhere like Anim School or Academy of Art, wherever have, you, you have, you get the honest feedback that, even though it might be brutal, it will help you level up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I'm going to probably touch on later is just like, yeah, you got to get honest feedback because that's, uh, we don't like it, but how else are you going to stand out from the pack? You have worked on some of the bigger uh, animated features in the last couple of years. How did the process of applying and eventually landing a job at Disney and Blue Sky, um, sorry, at Pixar and Disney go for you? What hurdles did you go through and what would you have done different if you were to go through that process again? Part of the process was like, okay, I'm starting from scratch. I want to get there. What level do I need to hit objectively to impress people at the hiring squads there? You know, so I need to go look at blogs. I need to go on Instagram and find out um, the personal portfolios. Of, I need to go on LinkedIn to find the names of these artists, you know, and just be brutal with yourself. Um, whether you're, you want to be an animator or a layout artist or storyboard artist, you know, set them as the target because if you can't get over their level, I mean, I hate to be really honest, but you're not, you don't really stand a chance. Um, and then also using LinkedIn or IMDb Pro or um, even blogs, I think YouTube now, channel creators can list their emails in the about section. Mm -hmm. Get in touch with these people, you know, cold email people because a lot of people want to help out. Well, what do you ask them? If you have some uh, pieces or portfolio sequences that you can show, show it to them, get the honest feedback. Um, develop a relationship where you can, you know, not every week or maybe not every month because you want to respect these people's spaces, but having a feedback loop where you're generating content and they can help you improve it. I think that's like, it doesn't get better than that. I think that's the model of anim school or animation mentor. In it. Perseverance pays off. I find that a lot of people tend to send an email or two and they're discouraged when they don't hear back within a week or two. And I think it's very important for artists, especially because we don't have somebody pushing us. If I may suggest starting your own YouTube channel, right? Constantly yeah. updating your demo reel and posting that on there, posting on social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, anywhere. The more content that there is out there about you, the more well, hopefully impressed the recruiting agents will be. And I don't know if it's the same from your experience, but um, I find that HR doesn't necessarily understand animation and the skill sets associated with artists. So if you can get through them, then it's better on you, which means you need to adjust the way you're promoting and marketing yourself to the HR, not necessarily to the hiring creative directors or heads of these studios, because it's a whole different level of what they're looking for versus what the HR is looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I've even heard that HR uses software to like, you know, if you don't have keywords, yeah, keywords, right? You can't even get a shot. So I think let's say you cold email hundred artists to find a DreamWorks and Pixar. If even one or two of them gets back at you with a positive response, that already jumps over um, HR. And if you show that, A, you're willing to take the criticism, be put in the sweat and the sacrifice uh, and hold yourself accountable to create work, how could they not respect that? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think a lot of the time, more or less, we get a lot of people that, um, they want a quick and easy way. Like, hey, what's the secret to, you know, get your job? And that's that's not going to fly. That doesn't merit respect. But, hey, I'm willing to suffer and I'm willing to work. I'm willing to be guided. Can you help me? That, how could you turn that down? Well said. So how does animation differ from directing? Directing, you have to know a little. You're not as focused in on one area. Um, but you have your hands in every department in the studio, so to speak. So you got to be an expert to some degree in everything to be able to talk to musicians, to sound designers, um, to also talk with your character animators. I think uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of transitioning to becoming a storyboard artist now. That's a really interesting position because they get to be mini directors in a way, mm -hmm. right? They see the film um, and they deal with all aspects of the film, including the acting and the editing. Um, so if, if you like sort of that macro view, um, it, it's a great job. Animation it is so specific. Um, that, you know, if, if, if you have trouble pulling out and seeing the film and the consequences of one scene, how does one scene affect the other? Um, it, it, you know, it could be difficult, so. For anybody who doesn't understand the types of positions or occupations that are in this industry, 
once you finish an animation course, can you share some light on the types of occupations that a person could apply for? You know, I could sum it up in the pipeline, right? Like the sequence of production. Storyboard artists are first. They um, they take the script, the written script, and they come up with almost like the manga or comic book form of the script, the first visual interpretation of the acting, what the characters look like, uh, in conjunction with the art department. Um, you're, you're almost like the director. And then, you know, you have the art direct, the art department as well, visual development artists who, you know, they design things like props, chairs, uh, characters, faces, the world, art direction. Um, so that's cool if you like, um, if you like designing things big and small of any uh, range. And then layout takes everything and puts it together for the first time in uh, CG or in 2D, depending on the final thing. And they get to work with the film in sequence, which is almost like directing again, um, while doing also a bit of character animation. So when does the director come into this pipeline? That's a great question because like he's, it's like non-linear, I think, because he should be at every step of the stage. He has to deal with all the things at once because all the elements affect each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of a nightmare for him. So, so is there any more levels after the, the layout? There's character animators and then um, set designers and then set dressing and then what else? Lighting and rendering, compositing, that's a whole other field that, um, right. You know, if you like to paint, you know, if color is your jam, then I mean, that, that's all for you. And then I think now stereoscopic people. Let's talk about one last monster at this point. It takes a lot to bring an animated film to life. Hours of work, commitment to detail, and a lot of moving parts. But the reward is the chance to create something straight from the imagination. Like you said, great job on storytelling. It is a 20 minute film, but it doesn't seem that long as long as you're in tune with the actual story. There's some questions that I have about the characters themselves. Uh, I, for example, I don't know why she was eating that cookie and it seemed like there was a focus on that, her biting the cookie. Please ready my armor. Yeah. Part of the approach of this film was like, it looks like I'm gonna make another action adventure fantasy anime based on Asian culture, in this case, Korean culture. But we wanted to sort of like play with expectations. So, you know, when we see a lot of royal or government officials in film and media, we see them very serious, you know? So the cookie was sort of to give the Empress like a playful side. Maybe this is how she deals with stress. And I thought you were supposed to do anything for your people. You know, with, with her prime minister being a bunny rabbit as well, um, this whole planet's very young. They're about to become, they're about to learn about the wider galaxy, the wider universe. So it's almost like this planet's growing up story in a way. Okay, so the film is a combination of 3D and 2D. How did you decide on the look and the feel of the film? It's, it's 2D with 3D elements um, for like effects and things. Again, because I love 80s and 90s anime and the themes that they're able to talk about are very, serious. I knew I wanted to do something more like an adult anime style, more sophisticated anime style. Um, we use Toon Boom Harmony for all that and Maya for the uh, uh, CG elements as well. And uh, yeah, like you were talking about earlier, it was, it was brutal. Just two people doing 22 minutes of animation for a year and a half. And then the final half of that was, okay, we need people to score, uh, color, light everything. So our team blew up to like 25 people. Um, so handling that all of a sudden was like right. night and day. And I just want to shout out, um, you know, Elmer again and Lulu and um, Kai, Jeremy, Eileen, uh, Jenna, all the designers and people that helped out on this film. Thank you for that. How did you put together the cast and the rest of the team? We used um, casting.com, which is a service where anybody can post a project uh, for theater, film, uh, voice recording. And... Uh, Interested actors can just send their resumes and then you just go from there to pick which oh. one is the most appropriate. So Elmer and I spent like a good two, three days just reviewing all our uh, submissions and then based on feel, uh, who to pick. Right. Uh, can we speak about the, the script writing process and the character development? So where did the ideas for these characters come from? Originally the idea of the film started out with um, I think a few years ago, I was introduced to the idea of the comfort zone. You know, this idea that what we think is comfortable for us may actually be very bad for us. And what we think is uncomfortable may actually be really good for us. So for example, exercise, I hate running. I don't think this is an idea. This is more of like, it's a fact. It, it, it's an unfortunate it, it, part of life, you know? And so I thought, how do I express this idea through a story? 
um, in which good is bad and bad is good. And sort of we, we watch that change. Again, using the anime and the Final Fantasy influences, I realized, oh, you know, I'm Korean. Is there something in my heritage that I can base this off of? And it turns out that ancient Korea in like the 10th century or 15th century, they isolated themselves from the world because they were being attacked by all the foreign powers around them. And I thought, oh, why don't we instead make it intergalactic powers instead of, you know, foreign nations. Um, and then from there, I worked with uh, David Zung, who is an awesome NYU professor of storyboarding on a weekly basis. Um, I wasn't a student there, but I was able to get in touch with him. And he was able to see my drafts and storyboards and give me critique. Um, I asked him to beat the heck out of it. And he did, and I thank him for that. Uh, at first, the writing was very disorganized. We didn't really, um, it was, it was just all over the place. But then David said, focus on the idea that bad is good and good is bad in this situation. Make the characters reflect that. I thought, okay, this is making sense. So for the Empress, for example, she starts out hating the monster and hating foreigners. She wants to build the wall, so to speak, um, and keep all the foreigners out, the aliens out. But then at the end of the movie, she realizes she's wrong. She has a character development. She becomes one of the monsters. I would do anything for our world, Tejo. So why am I listening to this monster? I should destroy him. And yet, he has done nothing to harm us. I do not know how to bring back the dead, but only a monster like me has the power to destroy the flame before it grows. Um, just giving a little depth to each of the characters, Oolong is a parody of like all those little Japanese and Korean mascots you see out there like Hello Kitty, um, but he's very bitter and he's also a politician and he's drunk. So it's like adding all these little, it's like a salad, each character, putting all these attributes in. Minister Oolong, please ready my armor. Yeah. So I was influenced for him by uh, Charlie Brown and Peanuts, the character design. Um, the general, General Bizzo, was more, uh, uh, more traditional, more human-like, because, you know, he's, he's a, He's a military officer, so that had to be more mature. And the turtle, um, in Korean history, there's a very famous admiral who defeated the Japanese Navy in like the 15th century, who invented a type of warship called the turtle boat. So I thought, oh, why not go further? Have an actual turtle that shoots nuclear shots, you know? Why not? Silence! The animation came after you've already had your voices. Yes, that's right. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Of course, your majesty. <gasps> I am here, my love. Run, run, run. What was the most difficult part of making the movie itself? I think just the volume work we had to do and uh splitting it between two people one thing i would have done differently is um maybe get one or two more animators just so the the burden would be relieved on me and elmer because you know even though elmer brought his a game and i tried to you know it's, it's a lot to ask from two people once the storyboards were locked in um to a point where my professor or me and several other people that i trust and consulted liked it you know that was it. It was just like, all right, we know where we're going. We know how to get there. We just have to put in the, uh, the sweat and the blood. But there's no question of um, whether we'll get there or not if we do the work. You've used Toon Boon for the animation. You've mentioned you use Autodesk Maya. What other softwares or plugins did you use in the making of this film, including anything for sound? Our sound engineer, Jeremy, used uh, Pro Tools, which is pretty standard from my understanding of in post-production. Uh, our composers, Lulu and Kai, used uh, a synthesizer called Omnisphere to generate some of the interesting textures and ambient pads. Elmer edited the film. He was the main editor as well. Um, in DaVinci Resolve, which is a free program, if you want to look this up, it's really, really powerful. I used to be a Final Cut user, but then I tried DaVinci and it was great. Uh, not only is DaVinci a very good editing program, they have, um, their speciality is color correction. So they have different filters to um, put on. Normally it's for live action, but when you put on the old 1980s 35 millimeter color filter on 
2D animation, it like it looks kind of retro. It looks really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm glad you mentioned filters because, you know, Flash, which is what Toon Boom is based on, it's, I've always found Flash to be a little too sterile looking, a little too perfect. It lacks texture. So if you can add in um, color corrector filters to give your work some texture, do that. I also put in an After Effects, like 35 millimeter film grain to make it feel more um, organic. Okay, let's touch base really quickly on your Fighting Spirits 2012 short film. Sure. Is that Academy Award? Is that? Uh, there's a student Oscars, which is run by the uh, Academy of Motion Pictures, but for uh, college and grad students. So they have an animation category. And so that Fighting Spirits was my uh, senior year thesis undergrad. So right. I thought I'll, I'll just submit it. And it made it to the uh, national semifinals, which is honestly like I, it blew me away because that was my first animated proper thing. So I was very humbled. What's next for you and your team? Like what is the status of your film? Are you guys working on any other projects? Well, you know, we're, we're working on the expansion of the story. I think when you, uh, if you get to watch the film, you'll see that it opens up a whole new universe. So we're working on developing the next chapters of the saga. Um, film, because that's where it started at. Comic book would be a great expansion of the world too. With Mad Artist, we actually have a platform right on our website that lends itself to creating uh, storybook magazines and uh, comic books, and it's freely available for any artist, animator, or illustrator. Just head on over to madartistpublishing.com, register for a free account, and then just click create a flipbook and all the tools are there for you. And it's actually very useful applying for jobs because it was actually originally built for resumes. So if you want to create your comic book, we'd love to have you use our platform and we'll be happy to promote it for you as well. It would be great to, you know, this world in this film is based on Korea, but there are other worlds out there in this universe based on Japan, China, every country out there. I think it would be fun to bring in that universe. And so while we're doing that, we're also promoting it on the uh, International Film Festival. And you've gathered quite a lot of awards. It's been, uh, I think, over 10 or something. The tour just started two, three months ago, so I like it. Do you have any plans on uh, getting back to the actual animation industry and uh, recruiting maybe some of the bigger talent that you're obviously connected to? It'd, it'd be fun to get some of my old friends from Blue Sky or Pixar to work on the next chapters of this, and I'd love to work on their things as well. Give me your top three things that you could recommend to people who want to get into this industry. Finding the portfolios online of the artists that are already working at the studios or studio that you want to work at, and using that as a reference point for your own work. doesn't mean you copy their work, but you know that your work has to match theirs or supersede it in the details, in the craftsmanship, the big and the small uh, things of the craft. Second thing is um, cold, e cold emailing artists uh, in the industry to hopefully get a mentorship. And don't just pick two or three, you know, try to find as much contact information as possible out there. Um, if you can get 50, that gives you a guarantee that, hey, one or two people might respond positively. What about software that you should pick up and learn before you actually get into um, school? Maya is a good one to get because Maya has a long learning curve. Um, I feel like I finally got comfortable with it on the job. Just learn it early. Uh, Toon Boom, you know, Harmony is the standard for 2D animation now, but their Storyboard Pro program is also the standard for storyboarding. And both programs are very similar. So uh, Toon Boom offers free trials, uh, as does Maya, I think especially for students. So download it, get on it. What kind of attitude do you need to be a good animator? I think just the hard work attitude, being willing to sacrifice, take critique, um, without losing confidence. You know, I was reading a book recently called Talent is Overrated, and it talks about how like, Tiger Woods, Mozart, these people were not born with some divine spark. They worked hard. You know, they, we don't see the drafts and the missed shots that they take. We only focus on the highlight reel, but that's really it. Anybody who works hard and sacrifices doesn't quit can do it. I mean, easier said than done, but that's really it. Yeah, nobody sees the grind. They only see the results yeah. of my final project, just as you probably, my thesis project. I. I swear I was up for, I think, three and a half days just rendering and figuring things out. They had couches and beds in the lab in our school. So yeah, so we could just stay there all night if we wanted to, all day. Nobody cared. That's not for everybody, but those are the things that you don't see. You're just thinking, oh, well, this guy used a plugin to imitate hair or, or cloth. And it's like, yeah, it's a plugin, but you need to know how to operate the plugin. It's like a car. Anybody can drive a car. Right, but if you know that the rules of the road, you're probably gonna get pulled over and never drive again. Right, put in the work.
Yeah. All right. So that's it. I want to thank uh, Gene Kim for uh, taking the time to uh, chat with us and give us his specific insight about the industry and now directing and filmmaking. Uh, I wish you all the success. I wish that you win an extra Academy Award and you come back to us in a year or two with uh, another film under your belt. Uh, and uh, yeah, so make sure everybody go and watch One Last Monster. You can watch it on our channel at uh, youtube.com slash Publishing. Or to learn more about Gene Kim and the rest of his team, Elmer, head on over to onelastmonster.com. As for you guys, thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching. Make sure you like, uh, click that notification bell to get uh, notified of the latest interviews like this. And films come on our channel and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Yeah, take care.